Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our masterclass on setting up a fund in Europe. Uh, yesterday, we looked at the European fund environment and we heard from the operators themselves the main challenges that are currently being faced by the industry, particularly we mentioned in terms of increased regulatory pressures, a focus on AML, and as a consequence, increasing costs as well. So all these challenges that the, the industry is recently facing can provide somewhat a barrier to entry for, for new entrants, new participants looking to set up a fund. So what are the solutions for, for these, these people and these operators? We then saw, in fact, that some jurisdictions, including Malta particularly, can provide a better environment for the smaller to medium-sized managers due to certain factors, including increased cost efficiencies, innovations in regulation. We mentioned particularly the Professional Investor Fund and the Notified Alternative Investment Fund, which we will go a bit more in detail today. Um, we also have in Malta an industry that is willing to guide and um, uh, provide varying levels of what we like to call hand-holding to these startups and the first-time managers, as may be necessary for them. And even an approachable and pro-business, yet at the same time, very robust regulator, which is the Malta Financial Services Authority, or MFSA. So we did look at the Maltese jurisdiction as a viable solution for those smaller operators and those wishing to set up a fund in Europe. But what now? What, what happens next? So, in fact, today we have with us representatives from the MFSA along with a representative from Ganada Advocates um, who will be informing us and speaking about the Professional Investor Fund and the Notified Ape and the actual process of setting up a fund today. What are the requirements? What uh, does the application process look like? and how does the MFSA continue um, to adapt and embark on initiatives to better the industry as well. We can see here directly from them what some plans of theirs are going forward. So introducing our panelists today, we have with us Claire Tanti, a senior manager within Hi. authorizations at MFSA. Good morning, Claire, and thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Also have we also have Sarah Farooja, who's the senior manager within the Securities and Market Supervision at the MFSA. Good morning, Sarah. Sarah, good morning. Are you with us? All right, I think she she just has some connection problems. She'll be with us in a moment. And Mark Kawanashi Kluna, who is a senior associate within the investment services and funds team at Ganado Hi. Advocates. Good morning, Good morning Mark. Thanks, Rebecca. Good morning. Um, so, in fact, I'd like to remind all our participants today again that there is a chat function available. Um, in which you can put any questions directly to the speakers. Feel free to, to ask any questions as we go along Look at them and um, try to address them the best way we can today. Um, Mark, I'd like to, to start with you, please. Yesterday, we actually mentioned um, particularly the professional investor funds and the notified alternative investment funds, with PIVs being mentioned as the flexible solution that actually allowed for the internationalization of the Maltese fund industry and NAFES on the other hand a fast-track solution to setting up a fund which which in fact these NAFES were the area in which Malta saw the most traction traction last year and continue to attract uh, operators to to set up their, their funds in Malta. Could I ask you to elaborate on these structures and explain what they actually look like and, and what the requirements are? Sure of course so Let's start off with the professional investor funds, or, or the PIFs in short. Um, so we, let, we need to understand exactly how, how these work and uh, how basically we can make use of, of the, the very flexible structure which the PIF provides. So first of all, the PIF itself is a licensed type of fund, um, which means that um, you go through a process with the MFSA to get the fund licensed and set up and is also subject to ongoing supervision by the MFSA, by the authority. Now, despite the fact that the PIF itself is licensed, it is not subject to a rigid and let's say very strict rule book. There's a lot of flexibility. In fact, 
when it comes to investments and borrowing restrictions, there are, there are hardly any. And the PIF can be set up to invest in a multitude of different assets, whether it's, I don't know, bankable assets, it's transferable securities, it's bonds, or if you want to go for more exotic types of assets, the PIF is, is one of the solutions which uh, managers and investors can definitely look into. Um, PIFs themselves, I mean, Malta also don't have many limitations when it comes to different types of service providers, which one can appoint. In fact, um, if you could maybe bring up the, the screen, Rebecca, I could go through exactly how we typically set up a PIF. So, um, the PIF itself, as I said, is very flexible. So, it could be set up as an open-ended type of fund or a closed-ended type of fund. It could be set up with different types of sub-funds, as you're seeing on your screen here. The, the, the benefit of having a multi-fund or an umbrella type of structure is that each sub-fund itself may pursue different types of strategies. So, for example, sub-fund one in your diagram could target a specific audience and invest in transfer securities, while sub-fund two, on the other hand, could invest in real estate. Um, this is one of the, the main benefits of the, the, the multi-fund structure here in Moore and also when it comes to, to PIFs. Now, each sub-fund itself is ring-fenced, which means that the assets and liabilities of each sub-fund are segregated from the assets and liabilities of another sub-fund. So, in a nutshell, if one of the sub-funds happens to go bust or have any other problems, those won't be leaked onto the other sub-fund, but investors are protected since there is ring fencing between each type of sub-fund. Now, as you can see, the way a professional investor fund is set up is that it typically has a board of directors, which has three members, right? And one of those members usually assumes the role of compliance officer or MLRO. Now, it is recommended and expected that the MLRO the money laundering reporting officer and the compliance officer are based in Malta naturally because uh, they would have the exposure and the expertise to the Maltese regulatory regime to obviously be able to, to provide a good service. And we have a number of individuals here in Malta and even corporate entities which can make such persons available. The founder shareholders on top of your diagram is the, uh, are the individuals who are responsible, the shareholders behind the setting up of the fund. And in fact, they typically have the management shares, the founder shares. So they would have the voting rights, the controlling rights when it comes to, to the fund itself, when it comes to changing its constitutional documents or appointing directors. These, uh, these matters rest with the founder shareholders and there are no real restrictions on who can hold the founder shares. Now, this diagram here is for a third party managed professional investor fund. Another sort of flexibility for PIFs is that it can be set up as both a third party managed fund, which means that there's an external manager, or else it could be a self managed fund. And we'll see that slide a bit later. So, the third party managed professional investor fund would have its own fund manager, right? One of the smaller, de minimis managers would be responsible for the portfolio function. And the fund manager itself, as well as the administrator and even the safekeeper, so the entity responsible for the custody of the assets, do not necessarily need to be based in Malta, which is what makes PIFs so attractive. Naturally, they have to be based in either an EU state or a recognized jurisdiction, one of those jurisdictions that is to which uh, Malta and the authority have signed a, a, an MOU, a multilateral agreement. The auditor, which is the entity which is responsible for the annual audits, would need to base them in Malta, but that should not be an issue because all the big players are also based here in Malta and there are also medium to small tie firms here as well. Um, now, one of the, uh, as I said, one of the flexibilities, one of the, uh, the, the, the positives of, of a PIF as well is that it can be set up as a self-managed fund which is your next slide here, which means that you don't necessarily need to have and engage a third party manager, but the board itself can constitute and establish what is called an investment committee made up of typically three members who will be responsible for 
the portfolio management function, that is selecting the assets within which the sub funds will invest. So just to sum up again, the, the PIF itself has very different features. It could be open-ended, closed-ended. It could be a multi-fund structure with different sub funds or as just multi-class. It could be self-managed. It could be externally managed. You could have service providers based in Malta or based outside Malta. It is really up to the promoters and obviously uh, what they would expect their, their investors to prefer when it comes to setting up a professional investor fund. Excellent, great. Now, before we move on to, to NAFs, actually, I'd, uh, I'd like to stick on this topic of, of PIFs because I understand it's a licensed product, right? And it requires authorization from, from the MFSA. So, Claire, if I could ask you, um, can we look at the actual application process and what this looks like with the MFSA? Sure. Um, uh, well, basically, typically, it um, it's there are we, we call them uh, three different phases uh, as part of an application process. Um, there is the preparatory phase, and there is the authorization stage, and subsequently there would be the the, the, the licensing and supervisory stage. Phase one would start based, um, first with a preliminary meeting. Uh, we call it a pre-application meeting. Now, in in uh, in terms of funds and fund structures, um, we typically entertain meetings for those funds that are usually or usually would have a, a complex um, strategy or an overinvestment strategy, or they would have um, uh, some unusual features. In, in, in that, I mean, in such instances, we try um, to engage with, with the applicants from a very early start because obviously we try um, uh, to, to, to start understanding the product much better. Uh, once this meeting would, would, would occur, um, eventually we would receive um, uh, the applicant together with his advisors, they would submit an, um, the application documents which would essentially, in terms of funds, would include um, an application form, the draft offering documentation, um, if it's going to be self managed for example, there would be the terms of reference of the committee and who would be actually carrying out the portfolio management function, um, as well as um, the PQ forms um, in respect of uh, the foundation shareholders, which, hold, uh, which would hold more than 10% um, ownership of the scheme and the directors and also of the portfolio managers in cases of self-managed funds. In that, uh, in that area, once we receive um, the application program, uh, the application documents, apologies, uh, we start from our end um, reviewing the documentation su submitted. So we would start um, an analysis of, of, of the, the documents and, and the application in question. We check the ownership structure. The documentation is in line also with, with the disclosures required in terms of, of legislation. Um, and we typically issue uh, our, our feedback and reason the documentation submitted between three to four weeks um, uh, from our foreign acknowledgement. We also start as well during this process our due diligence assessment process which would basically entail um, from our end carrying, carrying a fitness and preparedness assessment on, on the individuals who submitted a PQ. Um, from our end, we do conduct regular diligence checks. However, we expect that, that the, the, the applicant will also carry his own first filter of checks on, on the proposed um, uh, individuals. From our end, we assess four criteria, which are basically, obviously, reputation and competence. Reputation being that the person is, is, uh, is of, of trustworthy and dependable, and dependable and also competent in the area that he's going to um, be involved in. Um, there would be also solvency, that is, that the person is, is financially able to, 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 to carry out the function. Uh, we also look at time commitment, as well as the conflicts of interest and independence of mind. Uh, all these aspects would, 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 would uh, be uh, taken into consideration as part of our assessment. Once we're ready with our, uh, with our review process, um, we issue what we call a minded decision. So basically, the minded decision would be um, a form of a, an approval, a minded approval that we're ready um, based on the documentation that you have submitted um, and, and based on the communication that we have um, ensued throughout the application process. We are minded 
to proceed with the licensing um, of, of, of this fund, um, subject to um, a number of set criteria. These typically would be, um, say, for example, the incorporation of the scheme. So um, at pre-licensing stage, there would be um, certain methods that you that, that the promoter would need um, to, to carry out in order to be able to, to, to get the ball rolling, basically. Um, once these criteria are actually um, met and, 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 and satisfied, uh, we issue the license. Um, it's important to uh, distinguish between an in-principle and a license. So basically, an in-principle decision would mean that uh, subject to the satisfactory conclusion of, of, of certain um, matters that we are outlining, um, we will be issuing a license. Obviously, if that person, um, that promoter, would not be in a position to uh, satisfy the conditions, um, from our end, the, the, the in principle would cease to have effect. Um, typically, we try to uh, give the in principle decision um, a time frame, so it's valid for three months. So typically, um, promoters would have three months to satisfy the conditions. Now, there were instances, obviously, even at the moment with the pandemic and everything, um, that for, 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 for uh, valid reasons, the in principle decision um, for commercial reasons, say, for example, would need to be extended. And in that case, if it's a valid reason, we do, we do extend. Um, but we try, obviously, to, to, to keep in mind the, the three month time frame because obviously, ultimately, everyone would want to, to, to start at, at the ball rolling. Once we show, say again, exactly, exactly. But went. unfortunately, we appreciate and we do understand that uh, sometimes things things um, are out of the the promoter's controls, and and who would um, ultimately that person would need to 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 extend. Um, following licensing, uh, there would be once once we show our license. Um, we would include the, 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 the scheme in our, um, on our website in our financial services register, uh, which basically the register is uh, publicly available um, on our website, so that obviously um, uh, people, people would be able to, to know whether um, the, the, that the fund is actually licensed the Malta. <clears throat> This point, one thing I want to add is because there's a lot of components to, to this process and it, it can sound complicated, it's, it's not. And there's plenty of, of providers on the, on the island who, who provide like a one-stop 10 key solution. In fact, as, as BOV, we often work very much hand in hand with Mark here from, from Ganado to prepare the application and handle the entire process with, with the MFSA. And it's part of the handholding that we, we were referring to earlier. I see a couple of questions that have already come in from the audience. I'll start with the second question from Matthias. Um, is the session recorded? Yes, these sessions are recorded and um, you can feel free to, to drop me an email or contact me and I'll be ha very happy to share the, the recordings with you following following the sessions. Um, Mark, if I can direct the other other question to you from Martin before about the PIF structures that you were explaining, Mark, is this a standard structure or are there other variants allowed as well? Mark, you're, you're on mute. Yeah, I mean, okay. There we go. Um, no, as I was saying earlier, um, the PIF structure itself is is very flexible in the sense that you do not necessarily need to set up the uh, the fund itself as a CCAF. For it could be a limited partnership or a unit trust. So there are different types, first of all, of legal forms that the uh, the fund can take. And uh, when it comes to the actual service providers, I mean. You could have prime brokers engage directly, for example. You could have a larger board if you want. Um, there are very different ways of setting it up. I mean, it's just a matter of speaking to your advisors in Malta and, and making uh, that work. Um, Marcin has also told us, Rebecca, another question from what I'm seeing. Uh, how long does the standard application process take? Well, let's say the very first part of the process is very much in the promoters in our hands, in the sense that it is up to us to work on the documentation as, as uh, fast as possible and uh, identify the correct and, and the ideal service providers. When it comes to the application, obviously, the review from the MFSA would be much, much faster if we give them a complete package. In this, all positions are identified, and there are not a lot of gaps because, obviously, 
the MFSA need to conduct a review holistically of the entire structure. So the timing very much depends on you, but it usually takes around, let's say, three weeks uh, to, to draft all the documentation. The questionnaires may take some time, maybe just to collect police conduct certificates and reference letters, but when it comes to us, we always tell our clients to start with the PQs and focus on them first, because obtaining certain documentation may depend on third parties. So you want to get that rolling first. And then eventually, as you're waiting, you can work on the fund documentation for it to be submitted to the MFSA. Exactly. Yes. And the other, the other part of Martin's question, I mean, finding the, the local persons to sit as directors, MLRO and compliance officers, there are persons, individuals who offer the service and are already approved by the MFSA on other schemes acting in this capacity. So your advisors in Malta or your turnkey set of providers can actually um, provide you with a list of candidates for, for you to choose from. I mean, what we do essentially is we would provide you with um, the CV of a number of people, you would go through them, you would um, have a look and, and you can then set up one-to-one -one meetings with them and see who you would actually want to appoint on uh, on your scheme. Yes, um, Claire, you from our end, I mean, uh, continuing basically on what Mark was saying, um, it's important to get um, uh, the documentation uh, right, uh, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, as quickly as possible in the sense that the, the, the clearer the documentation and, and, and the more information that we have, uh, it would it would help in reducing the, the, the timing between our the, the towing and throwing between the MFSA as a regulator and the advisors on on certain clarifications of points. Eventually, once we get um, that process um, cleared out of the way, uh, it's usually it, it's typically quite a straightforward process. In the sense that would, there would be our internal approval process, which usually doesn't take that much long, and eventually the principal decision is issued. Once you have the principal. It's literally um, uh, taking down, I mean, taking a, a tick box approach, you know, incorporating the scheme, finalizing the offering documentation, signatures at board level, so on and so forth. So these typically um, uh, do not take long. And, and, and once we receive that, it's again, at, from our end, just a validation that we received what, what we needed and we issue a license typically within days. Yes, and Claire, if you can just stay here for a moment, and I can also ask Sarah to join at this point. There's another question from, from Peter here. He's asking if we're seeing a significant interest in digital asset funds in Malta, with territories such as Luxembourg and Ireland seeming seemingly reluctant to establish fund in this space. Now, I know yesterday during the panel, we mentioned that there was um, the PIF regime, the professional investment fund regime, that was adapted to cater for such virtual financial assets. Could you uh, elaborate yes, on that? Yes, basically from our end, um, we are seeing there is interest in, 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 in funds um, uh, established under, um, uh, under the virtual funds regime and, and so uh, actually investing in virtual currencies. Um, at the moment, how things stand, um, the authority first started with issuing a regime for the professional investor fund. Um, however, and, and, and we will be delving later on even during this panel discussion, as part of the initiatives of the authority, um, we also started looking at um, expanding this regime uh, into the NAIF regime and even to the AIF regime. One for the simple reason being is first mm -hmm. and foremost, um, which is obviously a plus to the industry. Uh, those funds that we that, that we actually started um, started licensing at the inception of the PIF regime, nowadays um, they are growing and obviously they are reaching um, the AUM threshold of the AFMD. So obviously um, there there is an actual transition process that needs to be carried out, and and, and these funds ultimately um, be registered as AIFs, licensed as AIFs, apologies. Um, and apart from that, we're looking into also um, uh, expanding the investment scope of the NAIF regime and, and, and subsequently also including these in, as, as a viable product under the FMD as well. Very interesting. And Sarah, so moving on, from a fund promoter's perspective. I mean, you're within the supervisory team, but you also have extensive experience in, in authorizations as well. So are there any particular features and, and factors which the MFSA looks for and uh, promoters and prospective applicants should, should keep in mind yes, when they're applying? Um, first and foremost, I would like to say good morning to everyone. Um, uh, earlier on, I had some connection issues. Apologies for that. Um, yes, sure. Um, 
as Mike mentioned, the PIF regime in itself is very flexible and although it allows uh, operators to obtain a license without adhering to, to the more onerous obligations under the AFMD, for example, such as uh, when it comes to certain service providers, they are not required to appoint a depository uh, for monitoring purposes or they are not uh, required to, to have a dedicated risk management function, for example, although there is um, that that uh, level of flexibility um, and also myself having a background in authorization, I note that um, uh, certain uh, PIF structures when it comes to supervision, they overlook, uh, they overlook cert certain aspects. Naturally, once an authorization is obtained, there are obligations that the license holders need to observe. And it goes without saying that the requirements of authorization stage should not only be implemented just for authorization purposes, but these should be adhered to on an ongoing basis. Therefore, um, in my position from supervision, I can only advise that at an application stage, uh, the applicant adopts a long-term mindset, so to speak, so as not to find itself in a panic situation once in it is licensed and it is faced with, for example, an on-site uh, inspection by the MFSA and not having the proper um, uh, policies and procedures in place, for example, what, what should applicants keep in mind at, at authorization stage if they had to look uh, to adopt a long-term mindset? For example, I can mention a number of aspects that they should that they should keep in mind and look into detail um, at authorization stage. When it comes to governance, for example, um, they may although it was not mentioned in detail by my colleague. Um, for example, we do ask that on the board there is an independent director. Now, um, on an ongoing basis, the MFSA, particularly from an on-site um, uh, engagement perspective, this is also scrutinized and, and, and assessed. Um, we do check the board minutes, we do check the participation and level of, of, of um, uh, communication of the independent director with the rest of the board. We do assess that, that um, the independent element on the board is indeed offering uh, objective and independent um, participation during the board. So it is important that the applicants at authorization stage understand the importance of the independent element on the board. And at that point in time, they choose appropriate uh, individuals to fulfill this role, not just um, from an independent independence from, from other service providers from that point of view only, but also um, to, 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 to choose individuals which do have the necessary traits of their character, uh, such as independence of mind um, and the, the necessary acumen to fulfill, to fulfill this role. From a supervisory aspect, um, we also check such as, for example, substance requirements, although these are um, uh, assessed at authorization stage from an ongoing basis. We also check um, that the license holder is still adhering to certain local substance requirements. As we've mentioned before, um, particularly, for example, for self-managed structures, uh, we do require that one investment committee member, at least one, is, is, is uh, situated in Malta. For the board, uh, we do check that one director is, uh, is resident in Malta as well. Uh, so although certain individuals do not, uh, are not required to, to, to submit a personal questionnaire uh, with the MFSA for, for, for authorization, we still, we still check from a supervision perspective uh, whether these individuals fulfill the necessary requirements. One important aspect from a supervisory point of view are the policies and procedures. These policies and procedures are not part of the authorization assessment and checks. But obviously, once they are licensed, they need to be in place. In place, apologies, and and obviously they will be subject to to MFSA scrutiny uh, once um, the MFSA uh, pays a visit to 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 the license holder to to a PIF in, in in this particular instance. For example, if I may mention a few examples. Um, uh, we on, 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 on a number of instances encounter cases where uh, we engage with the license holder and we find out that a number of policies and procedures are not yet in place months or even years after, after uh, obtaining authorization from the MFSA. So these are things which should be kept in mind 
uh, by the prospective license holder to 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 have in place once licensed immediately once licensed um, uh, so as not to find itself in a, in a situation where uh, they have to engage with the MFSA uh, no, and not only it's not only a matter of uh, sort of fulfilling or, or 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 having these policies in place just for the sake of uh, the regulator there there are obligations in place which need need to be um, uh, adhered to by the license holder. If I may mention one particular document uh, or, or procedure in place is the compliance monitoring program. And I'm mentioning this because in the case of funds, it is uh, in many cases not taken as seriously as with fund managers, for example. The compliance monitoring program is, is a tool which should be used by by the compliance officer to monitor and test the policies and procedures in place and to ensure that they are um, effective. It is not the first time, unfortunately, that we encounter uh, schemes not having the, an effective CMP, as we call it, compliance monitoring program in place, or else if they do have one in place, it would not capture all the relevant areas of, of that relevant um, uh, PIF. So I'm mentioning these items so as the license holder keeps in mind um, uh, these aspects so as soon as it is licensed, license that ensures that it has the necessary procedures in place. Um, so as you can see, although there are aspects which are not looked at into detail or not looked at at all at the authorization stage because it is not um, in the remit of the authorization process, we look at them from a supervisory perspective. No, that, that's great. Thank you. And even even the fact that um, the MFSA often keeps in contact with the industry as well by um, issuing an, a number of circulars. And, and I think the level of communication is, is great for the operators, you know, to remain um, updated and know what reports need to be done, what what they have to do, what the updates are, if if any. So so that's always great, yes. especially in this past year where we have to make extensions, etc. It was always, um, there was always a very good level of communication standing, um, within from from the part of the regulator as well um in in such in fact, on this point um uh, as you are correctly mentioning we do issue a lot of of guidance and and circular to the industry and i encourage um everyone to to i mean applicants who are interested to to set up uh, a fund in Malta to have a look at these uh, circulars or, or guidance we issue to the industry and because there is a lot of information in there from a supervisory perspective, especially what we look at and and how how um, we carry out our supervision as well. We do have documents uh, highlighting our supervisory priorities, for example, as well. So it would be very beneficial for Thank prospective you. applicants and eventually license holders to 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 have a look at these documents. Obviously, um, we we also are available to prospective applicants and and license holders uh, to discuss any queries they may have as well. Absolutely, um, thank you so much for that insight, Sarah. Mark, if I may ask you again, I mean we've seen the professional investor fund in quite some detail now. We've seen that they're a flexible solution. Um, we've seen that they provide less onerous regu uh, re regulatory requirements compared to other European fund structures and fund directives. Um, there's even the flexibility, which it seems to be quite a popular solution, the self-managed structure as well. And um, uh, even the, you know, not everything has to be, be based on more time. I mean, there are substance requirements. There is a requirement for boots on the ground to a certain extent. But the fund managers, for example, can operate comfortably from, from their jurisdictions as well. Um, and, and as well as, as a point that, that Martin um, brought up, that they can be structured in various forms to, and, and various forms of the structure to, to cater for the promoter's needs. So if we can now move to the other structure that we, we alluded to earlier, which is the notified alternative investment fund regime, because I understand this is not an authorized product as uh, as the NAIF is, right? So um, how, how does it all work if, it, if it's not authorized, sure. let's say? So um, we spoke about the PIF earlier and we said that the PIF is licensed. Now by license, we mean that you go to the process which Claire detailed and, and explained to us. So individuals, directors, founder, shareholders, you know, the compliance officer, these persons need to complete a personal questionnaire. That is with the PIF. Now, the PIF itself was born before 
directives entered into force. So it is a homegrown type of fund. On the other hand, the notified IF itself stems from the FMD regime, right? If you take a close look at the FMD itself, you'd notice that it requires authorization and licensing of the fund manager of the AFM and not of the actual product itself of the fund. So what the jurisdiction did is that it recognized um, that there are speed to market issues and that in certain times setting up your funds straight away because you have investors lined up is a priority. And the jurisdiction came up with this solution, the notified AIF. So as the term itself denotes, notified, this type of fund is not licensed by the MFSA, but it is registered. So its name is kept on a register maintained by the MFSA. And also certain documentation, as I would are also submitted to the authority for the authority to take a quick look, a high level review of these of these documents. Now, the uh, the notified IF is great if the uh, the fund manager itself is looking to market the shares across the EU because being an AIF itself, an, an altered investment fund, it can benefit from the marketing passport, which is made available under the FMD regime, which means that you can set up your fund in Malta. Um, and once it is registered, uh, it is on that list maintained by the MFSA, you can complete the notification uh, marketing passport, which is submitted to the MFSA. The MFSA within, within one or two weeks usually replies and passes on this notification form to the different um, jurisdictions which you would have selected in the form. So whether it is Germany, Luxembourg, Italy, the, the MFSA will liaise directly with the host state regulators, which means that you do not need to approach the regulators yourself and set up the fund again over there. Um, now, the notified AIF itself um, doesn't have this licensing requirement because the onus is, is placed on the manager. Now, the manager needs to be a full scope AFM, but again, does not need to be based in Malta, which means that you could either have an AFM based outside Malta, which passports its services here and can then manage the fund, or else you could have one of the many um, AFMs that we have in Malta being responsible for the fund. Now, what happens? Basically, as we're setting up the fund, it is actually the AFM itself which is responsible for the fund setup and the due diligence. So it is the AFM which is conducting due diligence on the different service providers which have been selected, sending out questionnaires, collecting CVs, and making sure that the directors, the administrator, the depository which has been selected are basically up to scratch. And the, uh, the AFM will then sign off a declaration that the due diligence itself has been conducted and we do not need to submit this due diligence to the MFSA. It needs to be kept on file, obviously, because if the MFSA were to conduct a visit in the future, we need to show this to the authority. But when it comes to the submission, it is very, very easy. And in fact, Rebecca, if you'd like to bring up the next slide we have prepared for our audience, we can highlight uh, some of the, the main features. Um, so as the slide is showing us, this is a fast track solution. Why? Because once all relative documentation has been submitted to the MFSA, so here we're talking about principally about the, the PPM, the offering memorandum, any supplements, and then the declarations by the AFM, then the MFSA has and is bound by a statutory limit of 10 working days. So that is just two weeks to reply and approve and register the, the fund. So it really is a, a solution which can work if you want to set up a fund straight away. I mean, maybe you have around three to four weeks beforehand selecting the service providers, collecting the due diligence and, I don't know, negotiating the depository agreement, management agreement, etc. But other than that, it's just 10 working days and the fund is set up. And these 10 working days, they apply even if you want to introduce certain changes to the fund structure. So if you want to update the PPM, the, the offering memorandum slightly, again, it is a 10 
working day time limit. You would submit the document in markup, and within 10 working days, the MFSA should give you the approval for the document to, uh, to be in force. The same applies if you want to change a service provider. Let's say you want to, uh, I don't know, change your depository or, or change director. Again, you are responsible for the due diligence. You just need to submit the offering memorandum with the new name of the director of the depository, et cetera, to the MFSA. So again, it is 10 working days, provided there's a smooth transition from one operator to another. There's also this, this fast track solution for changes in the name structure. Now, the notified AF itself has evolved. It was first set up in 2016, and it was initially, um, since it was being rolled out, limited to certain types of assets. But eventually, as the industry and the MFSA got more confident with the notified AIF, it, it opened up to new types of, of, of assets. So, for example, we have set up notified AIFs which are dedicated to real estate. Um, even shipping, for example, let's say you want to have an AIF which is investing in companies which, which control a number of vessels. That is also possible. Antique wine. I don't know, precious metals. So, so there are no real limitations right now. Um, Claire mentioned earlier that the, uh, the NAIF regime itself now is, or the authority rather, is looking into allowing NAIFs to invest in cryptocurrencies and virtual assets. So that is another plus. Um, so basically, again, the NAIF is, is, a, is a very a good solution if you, you want to set up your funds straight away. You obviously here, yeah, this is for bigger funds we're talking about and funds which want to market their shares throughout the EU. Um, if I may, on this point, in fact, Mark, um, yeah. the process currently how it is, um, you are right in saying that uh, we have allowed various um, various different fund structures and, and fund, uh, funds um, having different investment strategies and so far as the NAIF regime is concerned. Um, but however, sort of the, the, the current uh, practice is that um, in, in, in these cases, that, that, that fund would need to first try to the MFSA in order to allow that kind of investment yes. strategy. Now, with the initiative that, that we should be rolling out shortly, um, uh, we are going to make it um, the NAIF regime officially wider in scope. So the investment scope will, will be widened so that uh, the participant and the, the promoter would not meet the AFM rather uh, would not need to come beforehand to the MFSA saying, listen, um, uh, we're going to invest in a fund, we're going to, we would like to set up an AFE, say, for example, investing in, 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 in antique art. Is this allowable? Um, at the moment, we would, that, that, that fund would need to have our written um, um, uh, agreement. Now, with the widening of the investment scopes, then um, the, these needs of submissions would, would can, can be done um, uh, immediately without our uh, immediate prior approval, basically. Um, what I wanted to also add on is the fact that, as rightly mentioned by Mark, obviously the, the process is 10 working days. Um, why? Because ultimately um, uh, the onus is being made on the the, the AFM manager. So, as rightly pointed out again by Mark, um, the AFM is responsible to ensure that the, that the individuals and the officials on the NAF are fit and proper. Um, and also, the AFM is responsible to ensure that the offering document is in line with the FMD requirements. Um, all this, um, the, the, all, this, all this onus on the AFM makes it um, uh, the process from our end obviously uh, much smoother and, and, and faster and, and gives us the ability to process these names in term working days. Because you are relying on exactly. an AFM which is licensed by either the MFSA, MFSA or, or the EU. Another regulatory authority exactly. outside the EU because I'm seeing one of the, the questions here by Nigel, is the AFM meant to be registered and licensed in Malta? No. Not necessarily. No, you could have an AFM established in another EU member state, which has passported its services into Malta as an initial step. Again, a process which takes a very short time, and then it will proceed to, to managing uh, the NAIF. And just to tie into what Claire mentioned, she said that there are certain types of assets where it would be beneficial, again, to write to the authority beforehand. There have been instances where I personally have written to the MFSA and the approval came back uh, within two or three exactly. days. So, no, it's so, so no. it's a smooth process anyway. You know, it's just you want to be extremely sure if it is something completely new 
that that it is something which which will work exactly as well. exactly i mean ultimately um we try and so far as the naif regime uh we try to keep it um as a process which is as sufficient as possible this hopefully obviously this this initiative that we're going to embark on uh, very shortly will help to make that process even 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 much more efficient basically if I may add something from a supervisory perspective as well on this point, although NAFs are not licensed, as, as uh, Claire and Mark are, are rightly pointing out, the onus is on, on the AFIM. So um, if the AFIM is, is set up in Malta, that AFIM would be subject to MFSA supervision. So strictly speaking, they are indirectly supervised, so to speak. So when we uh, engage with, with the AFIM, if it is Maltese again, um, uh, from a supervisory perspective, we do check that that AFIM is uh, fulfilling its obligations in so far as, as the NAF is concerned, such as, for example, uh, we do check uh, the due diligence uh, undertaken by the AFIM on the structure, on the NAF itself, on the individuals, on the service providers appointed, so on and so forth. So, um, uh, indirectly, they are somewhat supervised. Like, for example, this year, we are carrying out a thematic inspection focusing um, on AFIMs managing uh, NAFs. Because it will give the investors the confidence that um, even Actually, though itself is not licensed indirectly it falls within the responsibility of the manager and the manager itself is a licensed entity and subject to supervision so we have got questions in the past but i'd rather go for a pith because it's licensed by the authority exactly. it's, it's not easy to sell an AFE when this is not licensed but that's not the case because again it is being managed by a host of service providers who are all licensed or recognized by an authority and indirectly the authority will be keeping a watchful eye on the manager exactly. and diligence it has collected in respect of the notified AIF itself. So the investors may achieve some level of comfort in, in what you definitely. are saying, Mark. Definitely, definitely. Um, um, yes, please go ahead. No worries, no worries. Um, I'm seeing um, a comment on, on, on sustainability and sustainable finance and ESG. Um, principles. Now, obviously, from our end, as 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 MFSA and even um, as as a, as an um, as Malta per se, as at a national level, uh, we're giving a push as well on 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 ESG. Um, in fact, um, recently there was the, the SFDR as well, which has been um, recently um, been, been issued as well and came into force as well, and even in Malta. Um, we're looking into uh, also uh, potentially opening again a, a fund, uh, a specific fund regulatory framework as well as part of these initiatives, um, uh, which we are looking into as well. So, um, yes, um, we're having as an MFSA and again as as at national level, the, the 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 focus is growing on ESG even even at at MFSA and and we hope obviously to be in a position also um, to continue uh, growing in this area as well. To answer Nigel's question, slides will be shared after the presentation. Yes, again, um, you can contact me and we'll happily share share the slides with you as well. Sarah, on this point, I mean, we mentioned widening of the notified AIF regime. Um, we've mentioned now, Claire just explained on the sustainability, there's a focus there as well. And even before we briefly mentioned virtual currencies, what, what else is the MFSA embarking on? What are the plans um, for the future and, and to better the industry? Um, so, strictly speaking, from a supervisory perspective, um, one important um, aspect that, that uh, will change or will affect uh, the supervisory engagement with license holders um, is the authorization charter. But I'm not sure whether my colleague would like to give the perspective from an authorization um, point of view first before I go into supervision. Claire? From end, I mean, you can you can continue with the authorization charge, and then I'll, I'll I'll focus on 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 other other aspects as well. Don't worry. Okay. 
Okay, so um, one aspect on uh, from emanating from from the authorization charter, which uh, will be uh, issued uh, this year, uh, affecting uh, license holders from a supervisory point of view, is um, the the concept of post authorization meetings. Now, um, what's going to happen? Newly license holders usually do not um, expect, from experience, do not expect uh, the MFSA. To, to carry out a visit and inspection on new license holders. However, um, this post authorization meeting is going to bridge the gap um, between uh, an entity obtaining a license uh, now and the time by which uh, a proper uh, on site inspection, a fully blown on site inspection, is carried out by the MFSA. So, what do we mean by these post authorization meetings? These will be uh, meetings, very short meetings held uh, between the regulator, the MFSA, as well as the new licensed entity um, to, to understand, for example, to gauge whether the business is developing in line with the plans and projections outlined at authorization stage, for example. Um, uh, we may also follow up on certain uh, post-authorization conditions. You may remember that uh, Claire mentioned earlier that as part of, uh, of the authorization process, once the license is granted, um, uh, license holders may uh, have some conditions to fulfill post-authorization. So during these post-authorization meetings, we would be um, following up on those, on those items as well. Um, not all license holders will be subject to these post-authorization meetings. So uh, if, we're, if we're focusing on PIFs, for example, today, um, as naturally NAFs, since they are not licensed, they will not be subject to these uh, meetings. Uh, not all PIFs will be subject to these uh, meetings. Naturally, we depend our our decision whether to hold a meeting or not based on the nature, scale, and complexity. And most probably, if it if if the PIF is set up as a self-managed structure it would be uh, more probable that we carry out uh, a post authorization meeting. So it is a way um, uh, for us to carry out supervision in a more efficient uh, manner. Uh, from a supervisory perspective, we are also, if, if I may, and conscious of time as well, mention a few updates from an IT point of view. Um, uh, the authority has invested heavily in, 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 in technology and, and, and IT related uh, projects over the past years and currently um, we are working on a, on a project to, to better our supervisory uh, pro processes and procedures. So, so we are working on this project to come up with, with this platform um, and, and enhance template, templates to harmonize and standardize um, the process of supervision across the authority um, as well. As part of that as well, we are also undertaking uh, a more robust risk management system. Um, from our end, we already have risk management systems in place and these systems, um, just, just, just to, 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 to give you a brief summary of that, we use these risk management systems uh, to a lot or, or to, to, to give a risk scoring to each licensed entity. Um, uh, Based on that risk scoring, obviously there are a number of parameters that we do look at. Um, we we uh, assign or, or we dis determine the level of supervisory engagement that we undertake with, with a particular license holder. So currently we are also working on um, making those systems more robust across the MFSA as well. Um, um, yes, if I may uh, interject on this one as well, um, as part of the initiatives and also forming part even um, of, of what Sarah's mentioning, um, first and foremost, we, we have embarked on, um, throughout the past year, um, we are focusing also on an asset management strategy. So basically the MFSA throughout the past year has engaged with, with different stakeholders, um, forming part of the asset management industry in Malta, um, with the aim of um, uh, understanding critical issues uh, encountered by practitioners um, in, in, in actually working um, and setting up structures in Malta, as well as exploring new strategic initiatives, um, both at the at, at MFSA and national level, um, in order to foster a longer sustainable growth of the sector, basically. As part of this, um, uh, this, this innovation process, as mentioned earlier, where um, the intention and, and there are plans, um, uh, there are plans to actually um, uh, expand the NAIF regime 
insofar as widening the investment scope, as we were mentioning, as well as even the loan funds um, rules, which are um, which have been updated um, recently in order to make um, the regime much easier to implement. Basically, we are also um, also uh, include. Uh, involved in the authorization charter and involved heavily in this in this digitalization process we are looking in into streamlining as much as possible the authorization process and digitalizing digitalize, digitalizing it as much as possible as well um, we are going to launch uh, very re very uh, soon uh, new digitalized application forms as well that they will be uh, submitted through finhub uh, as part even even in, in, of this process, we're looking into um, uh, making the diligence process as well more efficient uh, and, and streamlining as much as possible. So we're trying to also take certain initi initiatives such as seeing whether um, the terms of reverence actually requires MFSA approval, removing also, say, for example, the, the certain changes requiring our approval, like changes to risk management policy. The, all, all, all these small um, supervisory processes, basically, which which would help in, in making um, uh, working in the, in the sector much more efficient and working with the regulator much more efficient. Uh, conscious of the time, I can continue, but I, I, we're conscious of the time, basically. If there's any, any couple of things you would like to mention, Please go ahead and then, then we'll conclude. There's no problem. No, basically, uh, on this front, again, um, we're looking recently, we have also, say, for example, removed and eliminated the requirement for investment committee members to, to submit a PQ. Uh, the reliance is much more on, 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 on portfolio managers. Uh, all, all these, basically, all, all, all these set of initiatives will help in... in uh, coming out with the, the authorization services charter eventually, which will give also a set of commitments, both from the practitioner's side, um, as well as from, from the MFSA side, and so far as commitment of, of, of timings and commitment um, also in, in the level which is required in, in so far as, as uh, communication and approachability and, and the level of documentation is concerned as well. Great, thanks for that. I mean, it's always fantastic collaboration between operators and the, and the fact that MFSA communicates on, on its plans and going forward and even addressing the hot topics, if you like, that, that are out there at the moment. I mean, in terms of digitization, uh, we see that there's a lot of plans in the pipeline to address this, even on ESG factors, as, as Deepak and the audience brought up before, you know, and even, even as a jurisdiction, there's a lot going on there. I mean, uh, there's projects like vertical gardens which have exactly. been installed there's the european green deal which we are quite ahead of of time to 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 reach the measures in in time and there's there's all this exactly going and on as it's well. not a question of just um digitalization digitalizing the, the current forms um we're, co we're going through as an mfsa a, a very vast exercise where we're trying to harmonize as much as possible the several areas and the several processes um, that are um, at play. So basically we're trying to standardize even the application forms across sectors. And, and all this ultimately it, it takes, there is a lot of work involved and, and hopefully we are now in the final stages and, and, and soon to be launching uh, the, the, these the new revised application forms. Excellent. We look forward to it. Well, thank you so much, Claire, for, for that insight and as well for, for your participation today. I'd like to invite Sarah and Mark to pass any concluding remarks that they'd like to that, that they'd like to make at this point before we close the session. Um, from my end, Rebecca, uh, I thank you for, for, for this uh, invitation to participate in this panel. Um, from my end, um, considering that I'm more focused on, on, on supervision, um, if prospective applicants um, for, for, for fund structures in Malta are interested to um, uh, obtain a license and eventually um, have a more sustainable future in the sense that they would be um, more sustainable in the longer term, they should, apart from ticking the box um, at authorization stage, uh, they should also 
adopt a long term mindset um, and and um, make sure that they are sustainable in the in the longer term um, and they should be doing this by by keeping keeping in mind the the, the points I mentioned earlier today um, um, and I also would like to emphasize that it is important to read the to 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 read and 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 uh, um, ultimately um, uh, get get familiar with with the license uh, with the MFSA's um, guidance circulars and as well the supervisory priorities so that um, we all have our intentions aligned. Thanks, Min Mark. From my end, again, I'd, I'd like to, it was pleasing to hear that the authority itself is undertaking a number of initiatives as well. You know, so it's it's an active regulator in the sense that it is it is noticing that there are certain developments and there are continuous developments in the industry. So the fund structures which are available more to continue to evolve. So we heard that the notified EIF is opening up to yet more possible investments right um uh, the mfsa itself is willing to hold preliminary meetings as well even to discuss applications so that is even the case if you want to set up a manager here a multa which itself is, is is a straightforward process and something beneficial um again the mfsa have always guided us and been quick to to take our calls so that should all be kept in mind when discussing uh, potential fund structures here in multa Great. From my side, I'd like to thank all our panelists, Sarah, Claire from the MFSA. Thank you so much for joining us here today and for providing us thank with you. the updates and the insight into, into what the, the future holds for, for the industry as well from a regulatory perspective. Mark, thank you too for your very detailed explanations on the PIF structures earlier as well. I'd like to remind our audience that tomorrow we have the third and final part of this masterclass, which will be discussing from an operational perspective, now that we understand how the fund gets to be set up, in what format and what the process is with the MFSA as well, what happens from an operational perspective. So we'll be hearing from top auditors, custodians, fund administrators, legal advisors, and even on the point of fundraising tomorrow at the same time on this masterclass. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow and thank you all for your participation. Have a great day.